Time now for the Sunday Talk. Tonight, the politics of avoidance. From the halls of Parliament Hill to the headlines on screens across the country, there is feverish talk. But not much about the issue Canadians consistently say matters the most. Sweeping new powers under the new anti-terrorism bill. Jihadist terrorism. Jihadi terrorism. The international jihadist movement. Remarks about niqabs and the Muslim faith. Rooted in a culture that is anti-women. That leads to Islamophobia. Uh, none is too many immigration policy. Lots of talk, but not about another huge issue for Canadians. They seem to be whistling by the graveyard. Job losses are up, incomes aren't. Canadian household debt was bad. Now it set new records. Since last year, the number of Canadians in financial difficulty has shot up. Is there anything I can do about it? You know, find a way to make a lot of money and or rob a bank, I guess. <laughs> and oil prices have collapsed. Nobody's looking forward to Alberta's budget this week. Understand the significance of the problem that we're facing, recognize that there are no easy answers. And the federal budget is delayed with no set date in sight. Given the current market instability, I will not bring forward our budget earlier than April. In Ottawa, the NDP is one voice pushing policies to target pocketbook issues. Are you ready to fight for middle-class families? In an election year, should we be focused not only on terrorism, but on tough economic times too? I'm joined by our panelists. Tasha Carradine is a columnist with the National Post and iPolitics. John Moore is a talk radio host in Toronto. And our guest tonight, Armin Yelnizian, an economist with the Centre for Policy Alternatives. Hi, Armin, I'll come to you in just a moment. I'm going to start with our regulars, though. John, why is it, for the most part, that politicians don't seem to be focusing on the economy? Well, for starters, it's kind of boring. It always will be. Even though it's bread and butter issues and how we pay for things like mortgages and food and car leases, uh, in, in essence, it's drab stuff to talk about. More importantly, though, the government sets the tone, obviously, and the government has nothing to brag about. This was supposed to be this incredible budget, you know, up until the collapse of oil. I, honestly, the finance minister would have been able to do, like, a, a mic drop at the end of it and say, take that to the opposition. They were going to balance the budget, have money left over, new programs, get into the election. They're now struggling, obviously, improvising behind the scenes, trying to figure out how to come up with a budget. I'm told by a cabinet minister there is zero chance that there will be a deficit, which means this is an incredible struggle. Wow, quite a challenge, Tasha. Why aren't they talking about it? Well, two things happened. As uh, John pointed out, the collapse of the price of oil, and the second is the rise of the war on terror. And uh, your PAC alluded to that before um, we spoke now, is that you've seen all these incidents that have happened that the Prime Minister has picked up on with regard to uh, the jihadi terrorists, the impact that is having both in Canada and abroad. And we're constantly hearing stories, um, you know, Yemen, Tunisia, it does not stop. So the consciousness of Canadians is at that point, the government is seizing on it to essentially distract them from the issues of the economy economy and uh, the opposition has to respond so that is what we're seeing in the news cycle today army yeah, well, I would agree that instead of having an economic action plan, we have an economic distraction plan because <laughs> this government doesn't have a plan without oil. And they are so deeply committed to the tax cuts they promised in 2011, and that surplus has now disappeared. So the only way you can actually have a surplus, not they will have a surplus in 2015-16. Okay. No, pro no problem about that. The problem is in out years because these tax cuts cost a lot of money and the economy is slowing. And consequently, you're seeing them really struggle with delivering something that is reasonable in the next two or three years. And the opposition parties are not pivoting on the security issues that they're being handed to change that channel to talk about the real security issues that you mentioned at the top, which is higher household debt, flagging wages. These are the security issues that people deal with day in, day out. Tasha? Well, I was going to say that, yes, they do deal with them. But at the same time, the opposition cannot simply ignore the bills that are going through the House. And the major bills that are going through or the bill that's going through is C-51. They have to deal with that. Right. Second of all, the renewal of our commitment in Iraq is coming up, too. So you've got two issues where the opposition has no choice but to respond. And if they wanted to change the channel, the government, again, um, you know, is benefiting, unfortunately, from the fact that there is a constant drip, drip of news on the issue that people expected to respond to. 
Go I, ahead, think, I think it's strategic as well, though. Uh, Thomas Mulcair does take side swipes at the government. Uh, he was on our station recently, and he, he just mentions it as sort of saying mm -hmm. the rosary of what's wrong with the economy. Uh, but I also think they're waiting until, first of all, the second quarter is going to be worse than the first. And once we get closer to election day, I think they're going to start ringing the gongs again and again and again. The strategists tell me this election will be about the economy. It doesn't matter what we're talking about You're now. You're the senior economist here. When do you think the budget will be and how bad will it be? I, I have no idea when this budget is going to be. How bad will it be? I think they're really struggling with making it work over the two to three, maybe four year horizon that it takes to run an election on. And I, you know, I, I don't know what they're waiting for. Frankly, we had an alternative federal budget this week. We took finances numbers. We said, if you want an action plan on what to do when an economy slows down, this is what it looks like. You need to prepare the economy for the next phase of growth. We're grossly underinvested in infrastructure infrastructure, in R&D, in education. We know how to fix this thing, but this is anathema to where the government wants to go. See, I don't necessarily agree that they're so concerned with the long-term horizon. I think they want to be able to say, we have balanced the books this year as we promised. We are bringing in the tax cuts that we promised. They've already capped the family tax cut at $2,000. The reason for that was to avoid the bleeding that you're talking about in terms of finances. They have already also apparently not issued reassessments um, to people who might be in a position to claim that tax cut. Why? Because in the short term, they want to have the numbers on paper. But it must be pretty complicated because all we're hearing that it won't be before April. That could be August. It won't <laughs> be. You know, coming? Wendy, there's no, uh, there's no indication it will go past the end of April. I'm hearing the same sorts of things that it would be in April. And also, politically, there's something else happening in April, apart from the re-evaluation mm -hmm. uh, re, um, of Iraq, is the Mike Duffy trial. And mm -hmm. the government can, frankly, use all the distractions it can from that type of ethical uh, swamp that they could get into. So, obviously, there's going to be some bad news or adjustments in the budget with just because of oil prices. There's tough choices here. So, I mean, who will wear that? I mean, is it the party in power who will be, get the blame? Well, I don't think you can blame the government on this economic slowdown any more than you could in 2009. But I think you can blame the government for hiding uh, from the Canadian people and not talking about how bad could it be and what is your plan for, you know, making lemonade if what you got was lemons. Uh, and I think that's really where the government's going to wear it. We don't hear Justin Trudeau talking a lot about the economy either. Well, it's funny. His, his big thing is the middle class. He's been talking about that for a year. And in fact, he was doing well in the polls until the terrorism issue came and stole his thunder on that. And the speech he recently gave was all about the war on terror. Interestingly enough, if anyone has an incentive to change the channel back, it would be him, yet he's not doing it. John. Yeah, well, I think the Conservatives will probably try to argue that Justin's lightweight, which they always do anyway, mm -hmm. and what can you do with finance and economics? But I, I think the party has a better calling card. You know, deficits went out of fashion in the early 1980s with the election of Ronald Reagan. So if you look at the last 30 years, it's been 17 years of Conservative budgets, 13 years of Liberal budgets. We've had nine balanced Liberal budgets, two, and that's generous because one of them came on the heels of the Conservatives just being elected, two balanced Conservative budgets. So I think the Conservatives will try to argue that, you know, we control the, we're, we're the masters when it comes to finance and economics, and the record actually belongs to the Liberals. So I think that's what he's going to run on. Well, I actually think there's another problem here, which is that we're the 11th largest economy in the world, and our fiscal year is coming to an mm -hmm. end, and we have no fiscal plan for the next year. Not on You can't run, you can't, well, tell me what the precedents the, are. Uh, 2006, we had the budget on the 2nd of May. So it's, I mean, it is, they're, they're pushing it. And they were just elected a few months before. I know, I know. That but was let's their face it, the civil then. service like, does what's the budget. their excuse now? Well, well I mean, the excuse I'm not has been the price of oil. The, the excuse has honestly been, I think this government's been waiting for a stable a consensus between the banks as to where the price of oil will be next year. We do have one, more or less now. In fact, bank economists themselves are saying it's time to give us a budget because now we know roughly uh, we're looking at about $70 a barrel so we, can, we can make that's, predictions. That's optimistic. No, no, you're way, way optimistic. It's nowhere For near next that. year. It not was this crazy. year. It not was this crazy year, I mean, 42 this, this week. This year, not the yeah. thing next year it's, and that's what they need to know. It's not just the politicians who can be accused of deflection or denial or avoidance or whatever we want to call it here. I mean, uh, individual debt, household debt is going up. People are having hard times mm -hmm. but their debts are going up. The, the media, obviously, is running either because it's the most important story or the most exciting story. Who uh, d d should the blame be shared, do you think, Armin, with the, the media and, and, uh, and the public for not focusing as much on hard economic 
uh, decisions as are perhaps necessary. Look, the media's job is to cover breaking news and controversial news. And we have had lots of that in the last few weeks that the government has delivered. And so you have to cover it and the opposition has to respond, as you were saying, Tasha, to the big controversial things. The niqab has been controversial, C-51 is controversial. If we go to war in Syria, that's controversial. The economy pales in comparison to that. But this panel is doing exactly what we need to do, is talk about why is it that we don't have a budget and what does it mean to have very low oil prices um, going forward? You know, how do we actually build economic growth? Is our only plan oil in this country? Well, you know, it's the media, though, has been accused of going too heavy on the oil issue. I've heard that, too, in the sense of saying, that, well, the media was focusing so much on the collapse of the price of oil and what that could mean. And now we're being say, well, now we're, uh, acu we're accused of being too much on the terror issue. I think we do follow the news cycle. And the debt issue is interesting because when the media does focus on that, it tends to be a headline. Canadians are more indebted than ever. And then it recedes. And I think the reason for that is partly because debt is a personal responsibility issue. The government really can't affect how much you decide to get into debt. It doesn't even control interest rates. That's the Bank of Canada. So I think politicians have less of an interest on seizing on that issue. You know, my job is to wake people up in the morning and tell them, <laughs> tell them what the news is and try to make them feel good about their lives, even if there's bad stuff happening out there. Uh, people don't want to be reminded of their debt. Exactly. I also, I don't think household debt is that big of an issue, to be perfectly honest. But anybody sitting there listening to me in the morning or look, looking at us right now, if we start talking, you know, you're a bit deep in debt. I mean, that's like a conversation with debt. They change the channel from you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that may all be true, but we've got a government here that is responsible for saying, instead of preaching how we, we got off lightly in the wake of the 2008 recession, tell us what you're going to do about the fact that the median hourly wage is now lower than it was in 2009, that household debt is rising, and that economic growth is stuttering along. Right, What's your is, plan for this is, building a platform for growth? This isn't almost, a government that believes in telling people how to behave. To, uh, I, well, I was going to say, if the government could control the price of oil, we wouldn't be having this conversation, but uh -huh. they can't. So but they're they looking bet for, on it. They bet looking on it. For That's that the and um, they bet on it because that was the situation. It was high. Take the opportunity where it comes. And now they're paying the price. Well, terror and uh, tight financial times. They'll both be in the headlines for a while. <laughs> and tax cuts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeehaw. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Arlene. Okay. Thank you.